everyone. My name is Erin Garrett and I'm an extension educator in energy and environmental stewardship. And I serve the southernmost five counties in Illinois. Recently, I gave a webinar on understanding the relationship between native plants and a whole range of pollinators. And after preparing for that presentation, my curiosity in caterpillar identification was sparked because there seems to be a limit in the number of resources identifying caterpillars. So I wanted to try to fill that gap today. So today we're going to talk about what a caterpillar is, some features to look for when identifying them, how we can support their part of the butterfly, moth and, butterfly and moth life stage, and then we're gonna go into some specific examples of how to identify just over 30 species of caterpillars in Illinois. All right, so most of us probably know that a caterpillar is the larval stage of a butterfly or moth, but it's important to mention because oftentimes we forget that caterpillars don't just turn into butterflies, but also many thousands of species of moths. So when we look at the place of caterpillars in the butterfly and moth life cycle, they are the second stage. So they emerge from eggs and then they will become a pupa before emerging as an adult butterfly or moth. The caterpillar life stage is the feeding stage where the caterpillar will change dr drastically in size in a very short time. So to accommodate this rapid growth, caterpillars go through five growth stages, which are called instars. Here we can see the five instars of the monarch caterpillar. The caterpillar will molt to transition between instars. And you can hopefully see in pictures three and five, how the shell of skin left behind is very thin. And this is because during that molting process, the caterpillar will actually digest and reabsorb most of its skin. So it just leaves a thin layer that sheds off. The different instars of a caterpillar vary in size, but what you may not know is how the colors and patterns of caterpillars can change and change very drastically as it advances through the five instars. So in this example of the monarch caterpillar, the most drastic change is between instars one and two. So at first in instar one, the caterpillar has a black head, but if we notice in the other instars, it doesn't have a black head. So that change happens as that caterpillar sheds its skin and gets to the next instar. We're going to look at several examples of caterpillars today that drastically change their appearance as they grow. Here's another example. This time we have milkweed tussock moth caterpillars. And in the left picture, we can see the first instar caterpillars. And in fact, you can even see some eggs that haven't hatched yet up in the top corner. And then in the right picture, we can see later instars where the hairs and the color patterns of the caterpillars are more developed and pronounced. So when we're identifying caterpillars, we may be looking for a caterpillar that looks like the one in the right picture and not know that the other instars are the same species. Okay, after the caterpillar reaches its fifth instar, the next stage is to become a pupa. And this is the transformation stage between caterpillar and adult. And I just wanted to provide some clarity when it comes to terms that are often used interchangeably. So first of all, a pupa is a butterfly or a moth in that third life stage. A chrysalis refers to the hardened exoskeleton of a butterfly pupa. So moths do not form a chrysalis. And in contrast, a cocoon is a silk casing spun by some moth caterpillars to protect them in the pupa stage. So the actual pupa is not the cocoon, but the cocoon is an extra protection feature. Here we can see two stages of the monarch pupa. The chrysalis turns from green to black and translucent when the adult butterfly is getting ready to emerge. Okay, now that we've looked at caterpillars in the life cycle, let's take a step back and think about why they're important. So if we want to see sites such as this one in the photo, where we have at least nine great spangled fritillaries, and I challenge you to count and see how many orange butterflies you can find in this picture. Uh, if we want to see all these butterflies circling these coneflowers, then we need to consider how best to support their complete life cycle, rather than simply the adult form. We're really good at supporting butterflies with lots of flowers and nectar sources, but we don't necessarily do as good at providing habitat and food for caterpillars. 
So more specifically, most of the butterflies and moths we enjoy seeing are native to Illinois. And when you consider that 90% or nine out of every 10 insect larvae, which includes caterpillars, only eat the plants with which they co-evolved, that means that native caterpillars, for the most part, prefer to eat native plants. Now that doesn't mean you won't find them munching on a non-native plant, um, just their preference overall um, is for those native plants. So if we want to support caterpillars, we need to understand what plants they feed on. So for example, here we have two caterpillars that feed on milkweeds, the milkweed tussock moth and the delicate cycnia. So without milkweed plants, these caterpillars won't be able to thrive. So just to quickly recap what a native plant is, they are part of the larger ecosystem that's developed over many years in a particular area. And this means that those plants are adapted to the specific environmental range of conditions of an area, and they interact with the natural elements of the area, like insects and wildlife. So when we think about supporting caterpillars, it's important to note that the food they need might be different than the food the adult butterfly or moth of the same species will visit. So we can think about these two types of food separately. We call caterpillar food and habitat host plants, while the flowers visited by butterflies and moths are referred to as nectar sources. So if we want to best support that butterfly or moth, we should consider planting a host plant and a nectar source. So to look at a few examples, in the top we have a snowberry clearwing caterpillar, and we can see the moth that it turns into. The, um, both the caterpillar and the moth will use snowberry, so as a host plant and a nectar source, but caterpillars will also feed on hawthorn and viburnum, and the adult will visit vervain. So we have some variety of what we could be planting. The second example is an American snout, and that caterpillar feeds on hackberry trees, while the adult visits asters, dogbanes, dogwoods, and goldenrods for nectar. So it's important to distinguish between those, because in, in that last example, we need to have a woody plant, a tree, to support the caterpillar, but then flowers to provide nectar for the adult. So before we move back to caterpillars, I just wanted to briefly mention some native plant garden considerations. Um, so we always want to consider planting a variety of plant types um, and plants that span the course of the growing season to provide numerous different food sources. Because caterpillars will be eating the plants you plant, it's better to plant larger clumps of similar flowers because hopefully that damage may not be as apparent unless you get a pretty large population of that caterpillar. And think about the placement of your garden as well. So I would suggest not planting milkweed out by your mailbox because by the end of the season, milkweed plants are oftentimes stripped of their leaves and covered with aphids. So you might want to consider finding a nice backyard location for those plants instead. We want to remember to reduce our use of chemicals so we're not harming our native insect population. And also consider avoiding reed, weed barrier or heavy mulch. And that's so we make sure to provide access to the ground for species that pupate underground. I know from experience it's very beneficial to put down mulch. However, there are ways we can get around it. So if we can achieve the type of garden in the picture here where we have large clumps of flowers close together, that actually reduces the need for mulch because they act as a natural weed barrier. Okay, now that we've gone over some background information, let's shift to caterpillar identification. And this will be the remainder of the presentation. So let's begin by looking at the morphology of a caterpillar and what features we can look for in identifying them. So a caterpillar has three main body segments, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. So the head has chewing mouth parts, which makes sense because the caterpillar is going to do an enormous amount of feeding. Next, we have the thorax, which consists of three body segments. And each of these segments has a pair of true legs, which are black and white striped on this caterpillar. Next, we have the abdomen, which has 10 segments. Now, on some caterpillars, it's difficult to count those last few segments. I know on this one, I had a hard time identifying them and piecing them out. Um, but it's important to note that because we can find pro legs or extra gripping features on segments 3, 4, 5, and 6, and 10 of the abdomen. 
Now this isn't the case for all caterpillars. There are some that only have a few prolegs. Um, inchworms don't have those prolegs on three, four, five, and six. So those can be helpful identification features as well to check and see how many prolegs the caterpillar has. And then one other feature I wanna point out is something called spiracles. And these can be seen along the abdomen and some in the thorax as well. Spiracles are pore openings that allow for gas exchange, but often they have different colors or patterns that we can use to help distinguish them. So this is kind of the typical pattern where they um, kind of have a black and white eye looking appearance, um, but we'll look at several examples today and use that as an important feature to look for in identifying them. Besides just the general picture of the different parts of the caterpillar, other things we would use in the case of identifying this specific one is we can see that it has a red horn or a tail on the base, and there is some slight hairiness to it. So we'll talk about this one a little bit later, but it is the tobacco hornworm caterpillar. Okay, so when it comes to actually identifying a caterpillar that you find, where should you start? We're going to cover some prominent characteristics you can look for that will help you identify. Specifically, we want to take note of colors, patterns, hairs, which are also called setae, but we're going to keep it simple and call them hairs, and extra adornments or other features like that tail. So for example, if we looked at this Henry's Marsh Moth caterpillar, we would see a cream and black mottled caterpillar with orange spots. From those orange spots, we can see clusters of hairs, and then we can hopefully also see that cream stripe along the side of the abdomen. So making note of all of those features together, we can hopefully um, make a positive identification of this species. But let's start and look at these different characteristics. So we'll start with color, and I have seen nearly every color of the rainbow on a caterpillar. And we can see that diversity of color in just these three examples here. So that pearly wood nymph on the left has orange, white, and black bands. The brown hooded owlet moth in the center actually has five different colors on it. It has orange, blue, yellow, black, and red. And then finally, we have that black swallowtail, which has a green body, black bands, and orange spots. So taking note of the colors, and maybe even more importantly, the pattern is really important in helping identify. So caterpillars can be banded, like that orange, white, and black one we just saw, or they can be striped. And we can see a stripe in this cloudless sulfur on the top right, a yellow stripe. So stripes run the length of the body, while bands wrap around the body segments. Caterpillars can also be spotted, they can be modeled, they can be camouflaged, they can mimic other creatures, and they can also have slashes on them, okay? Um, so the spice bush swallowtail has those characteristic eye spots that make it look like a much larger um, creature to say a bird that's coming to try to eat it. Okay, next is hairs. So there are different arrangements of hairs, and it's important to note that for people with sensitive skin, um, some types and arrangements of hairs can be irritating to your skin. So um, I know many of us are familiar with picking up woolly bear caterpillars, um, but sometimes those hairs can be irritating. So I just urge you to be cautious when handling caterpillars, especially if they have hairs. So there's different arrangements. We can see sometimes those hairs are really dense. Sometimes they're just tufts where you can see the body color underneath. Um, that salt marsh moth caterpillar in the top right, I can see that the body looks yellow and there's kind of some black striping on there underneath those tufts. And sometimes hairs are really sparse. So the, the best example to look at all different types and arrangements of hairs is the white marked tussock moth caterpillar. And we'll look at him more in depth later, but he has sparse black hairs, clusters of white hairs, really dense clusters of other white hairs. So there's, there's a lot of different arrangements, um, but just taking note of that can be very helpful. Um, and then also noting if there aren't any hairs is also uh, an important feature as well. Okay, and finally, probably my favorite part to start looking at identifying a caterpillar is to see if there's any extra 
adornments or features that we can note on that caterpillar. So caterpillars can have tails, which are often also referred to as horns, and tails can be different colors. They can be a single tail, they can be a split tail, they can face the head, or they can face the rear. Okay, so looking at what the tail looks like um, can actually get kind of in depth as well. Um, we can say, see that there are horns sometimes. Um, they're often called head horns, but they're actually on the thorax segments, so we could call them thorax horns, um, like in this hickory horned devil. They can have knobs, which are other um, projections along their body, like in the pipe vine swallowtail. Another type of hair feature is a lash, which is a really exaggerated, dense clustering of hairs, again, in that white marked tussock moth. And finally, we can have spines. And just like a hairy caterpillar, even more so, if you see a caterpillar with spines, I urge you not to touch it with your bare hands, but to put a glove on if you're planning to handle it. Speaking from experience, that exact IO moth in that picture I had a pretty nasty sting. Um, I didn't realize he was on my backpack, reached back to grab my water bottle and thought a wasp had stung me. Um, it was very, very intense pain. So I urge you not to go and handle these um, with your bare hands, but great identification features if we do see them. Okay, so where should we look for caterpillars? Well, many of them are going to feed on the bottoms or even on the tops of leaves. So that's a great place to look for them. Um, for example, I was walking under a catalpa tree and I looked up and saw that catalpa sphinx moth. Those tussock moth caterpillars were on the underside and the top of that leaf munching away. Um, but sometimes we can look on flowers as well. Um, I found that goldenrod flower moth caterpillar on the end of a flower. And then oftentimes we can just look for them when we're out on a walk and see them on a pathway. It's important to note that if you are trying to identify a caterpillar, if you can also take a picture of the plant that it's on and identify the plant, that's a really helpful clue. As we see in that milkweed and catalpa, those caterpillars are named based on what they feed on. So if we're able to have that information as well, it can be really helpful in narrowing down what um, potential species that caterpillar is. Okay. So we're going to move into looking at specific examples of caterpillars and how to identify them. So we're going to look at what the adult butterfly or moth um, looks like from that caterpillar, what host plants they feed on, and when you can expect to find them. So to decide what species to include in today's talk, I wanted to focus on the more common and charismatic butterflies and moths we have throughout Illinois. Um, so what I did is I searched a website called Butterflies and Moths of North America, and we'll share the link for that website later because it's a great resource, and they have um, occurrence lists of the species that we have in Illinois. So I looked for the most commonly found species, and as I went through that process, learned that some of the caterpillars of some of those more charismatic species actually can be some serious pests. Um, but as we know, any insect in a large population can have negative impacts. So keep that in mind as we move through these caterpillars. So we'll look at some that do cause a lot of damage. We'll look at some that hopefully don't cause a lot of damage, but also just to get you more familiar with what types of butterflies and moths those pest species do become. Okay, so we're going to start with the butterfly caterpillars. And first up, we're gonna look at the milkweed butterflies. And there's only four species of these butterflies in North America. In Illinois, we just have the monarch, but you may have also heard of the queen butterfly or the soldier butterfly. Those are also in this family. And then when feeding on milkweeds, these caterpillars acquire certain alkaloids that make them unpalatable to predators. So hopefully most of us are familiar with the monarch caterpillar. If we leave today only knowing one caterpillar, hopefully it's this one, okay? Um, we can see that it has black, white, and yellow bands along the body. And it has two long black horns on the head or near the head and two small near its rear. We can find them spring through summer, and we can support them by planting milkweeds. Okay, that's the easy one. So moving on, the next group of caterpillars we'll look at is the swallowtails. And this group of caterpillars have something called an osmotarium, 
which is a scent gland that is orange to red and forked. Hopefully we can see it on this picture. Um, when they're provoked, they'll avert um, this gland and release a foul odor to try to detract predators. So we're gonna look at six different swallowtails and we'll start with the black swallowtail. And this is our first example of a caterpillar that looks radically different depending on which instar or growth stage you see it in. So you might be familiar with the, bot the caterpillar in the bottom picture, but may not have seen the caterpillar in its early instars as in the top picture. So early on, the black swallowtail caterpillar has a black body with a white splotch on its back and orange spiracles. Remember those pores along the side of the body. Later, the body is light green with white and black bands and orange spots along those black bands. Also early on, you can see branched spikes on the body, but those fade away as the caterpillar moves through those growth stages or instars. You can find these caterpillars May through October, and unfortunately, many of you probably know this one can be a pest in your garden, preferring plants in the carrot family, and it's also referred to as the parsley caterpillar. Okay, the eastern tiger swallowtail is another caterpillar that drastically changes its appearance as it changes in stars. This is also our first example today of a caterpillar that resembles a bird dropping, and we'll see this numerous times today. So in early instars, the caterpillar has a brown body with either one or two white bands along the back and several white dots along the back of the body as well. Later, the caterpillar is green, turning dark brown when it's ready to pupate. In all instars, the caterpillar looks humpbacked, and this is a trend we'll see in several other swallowtail caterpillars. And of course, in the later instars, the caterpillar has those iconic eye spots. You can find them May through October on many different tree spe species such as birch, basswood, and magnolia. Okay, the spicebush swallowtail caterpillar looks very similar. The early instar resembles a bird dropping, but this time that caterpillar has eye spots in that early growth stage. That's one easy way to tell it apart from the tiger swallowtail caterpillar that we just saw. So they both look like bird droppings, but the spicebush has eye spots. Later instars can be green, yellow, or orange, and they have six blue spots on each segment. Again, this one looks humpbacked, and May through October, you can find them on spicebush and sassafras plants. So this one is more of a specialist feeder. Oops, I forgot my arrows on this one. I apologize. So here we have the eye spots on the young instar. We've got the blue spots. Okay. Next is the pipe vine swallowtail, and that caterpillar looks very different than the last two. An orange to dark brown or black body with knobs on it. You can see two prominent knobs behind the head and smaller orange knobs along the body. In later instars, the caterpillar is covered in fine velvety hairs, which you may be able to see the sheen of on the black caterpillar. May through October, you can find them feeding on pipe vines. My personal favorite swallowtail is the zebra swallowtail. I was so excited when I found one in my backyard last year. Um, it just brought such joy seeing that one. I think it just looks very iconic. Um, its caterpillar is relatively unique with a white, yellow, and gray banded body and one black band behind the head. It also looks humpbacked and May through November, you can find them on pawpaw trees. Okay, our last swallowtail is the giant swallowtail. It is another bird dropping mimic. It varies a bit from early to late instars. The early instar is in the bottom picture with a brown body, one white splotch on the back, and branched spines. The later instar on the top left is more mottled brown with two white splotches and flattened segments near the head, and it's also lost those branched spines. July through October, you can look for these caterpillars on hop tree and prickly ash. And in the southeast portion of the US, um, they can be a very serious pest to citrus farmers and they um, call this caterpillar the orange dog. So you may have heard that caterpillar name for this species. 
Okay, moving on from the swallowtails, our next group of butterflies are the brush-footed butterflies, fritillaries, and wood nymphs, which are all included in one family. There are over 150 different species of butterflies in this family in North America alone. The caterpillars of most of them are covered with spines and knobs, which is which uh, another type of knob that we'll talk about. And we're going to look at the caterpillars of 10 different species in this family. So first up is the viceroy. And while the butterfly looks like a monarch, the caterpillar looks very, very different from a monarch caterpillar. This one varies greatly in color. And we have three different examples you can see here. We have a green colored one, a brown, and a reddish colored caterpillar. Typically, no matter what type of coloring it has, it has a mottled pattern with either white or pink or cream splotches on it, overall resembling a bird dropping, especially in the brown and the red stages. Hopefully we can see the brown horns or reddish horns on the head that have barbs on them. And then there are smaller white, green, or red barbed tubercles. And we haven't talked about tubercles, but they're just less pronounced knobs, but still some sort of swelling on the caterpillar. So we could call them a knob. More technically, they're called a tubercle. Um, and in the case of this viceroy, we can hopefully see those small white barbs emerging from those tubercles. That will be important when we get to our next caterpillar. We can find these guys early summer through fall on willows, elms, oaks, and cherries. Now keep a picture of this brown viceroy caterpillar in your head as we switch slides. Because the red spotted purple caterpillar looks extremely similar. This one can also range in color, but typically includes white, green, and brown mottled patches, again resembling a bird dropping. So just like the viceroy, the red spotted purple has brown horns with barbs near the head and small tubercles, uh, mostly on the thorax segments, but some near the rear as well. The best way I have found to tell them apart is that the red spotted purple typically has less pronounced tubercles that usually don't have barbs. Now there's a lot of typically and usually because nature doesn't always follow the rules. So even in this picture, I can see some small barbs on some of the tubercles. So unfortunately, there isn't really a lot of good ways to tell these two apart. Um, unless you're able to find one of those other color morphs of the viceroy. We can find them early summer through fall, so same time period as the viceroy, and on similar host plants. So we don't even get an extra clue when comparing them that way. So I give you the best of luck in trying to tell these two apart. If you can follow it and watch it and see when it pupates, what butterfly it turns into, that's really what I've seen is the best way to tell them apart. So not really uh, a great way to tell them apart as caterpillars. Okay, next is the variegated fritillary caterpillar. And this one has an orange to red body with four fragmented white stripes, two black horns and black spines along the body. You can find them June through October on some herbaceous plants, including violets and passion flower. Next is the red admiral caterpillar, and it usually has a brown to black body, but in early instars, it can be green as we see in the top photo. It has a yellow stripe along the body in those later instars, and also has spines along the top and sides of the body. This caterpillar has a relatively long window of when you can find it March all the way through October. It can be found on plants that you may not wanna to get too close to though, plants in the nettle family. So not that you necessarily want to be searching for this caterpillar, but if you happened to have a patch of stinging nettle that you were treating and you found a caterpillar on it, there's a chance that it could be a red admiral. Okay, the question mark butterfly is another one of my personal favorites because it has such a unique name, named for that white marking on its wing. Its caterpillar has a black body with variable yellow or white spots and stripes along the body. We can also see spines 
that can be yellow to orange, but they always have black tips. And hopefully we can see the black tips on the spines in that picture. We can also see white and black spiracles. And May through September, you can find them on elm trees, hackberries, and then also nettles. So this is another one, just like the red admiral, that you can find on nettles. Moving on, we have the common buckeye caterpillar. And it will range in color from orange to black. And then later instars has an orange head and orange spots along the spiracles. There's also a white stripe along the side of the body and oftentimes blue spots near the top. Branch spines that are black can be found along the body as well. May through October, you can find these caterpillars in your garden on snapdragons, ruellias, and even toad flax and plantains. Okay. Painted lady caterpillars are quite variable in color, but typically the body is black to gray with some yellow or cream stripes along the sides of the body. The spiracles can be seen black outlined in cream. This caterpillar has both short tufts of hair and spines that can be orange or white. May through October, you can find this caterpillar on thistles, mallows, and different plants in the legume family. Now, while the painted lady butterfly looks very similar to the American lady, the caterpillars look drastically different. So here we have the American lady caterpillar and the body is black overall with yellow and black bands between the segments, two rows of red and white dots on top and a creamy stripe on the sides of the body. It has branch spines all along the body that come out of the red dots. And the spines can range in color. May through November, you can find them on asters, ironweed, and wormwood. The morning cloak caterpillar is striking and relatively easy to identify. It has a black body with small white speckles all along it and large orange spots just on top of each segment. It is covered with short white hairs and black branch spines. June through July, a relatively short window, you can find them on many of our native tree species. And the last, caterp the last caterpillar we'll look at in this family is the American snout. This caterpillar is very simple, a green body with minute yellow spots and a yellow stripe. May through June, and again in August, you can find it feeding on hackberry trees. All right, the last group of butterfly caterpillars we'll look at is the skippers. And they're so named because of their rapid flight pattern, which resembles skipping. They're actually not considered true butterflies, but they are more closely related to butterflies than they are to moths. There are over 250 species of skippers, but we're just gonna look at one. The silver spotted skipper is one of the easiest adult skippers to identify and its caterpillar is very unique as well. A yellow to green body with very pronounced red brown head characterizes this caterpillar. You can hopefully see the faint bands along the body and the two orange eye spots on the head. Summer through fall, you can find this caterpillar feeding on black and honey locust as well as wisteria. All right, let's take a breather because we've made it through about 18 species so far. And hopefully we're gonna be able to remember at least five of those butterfly caterpillars. If we can leave today remembering between five and 10 caterpillars, we're off to a great start. And I just wanted to review a couple lookalike species side by side. And especially when we see them side by side, we can more easily tell differences. So a lot of the times people get black swallowtails and monarch caterpillars confused. But if we look at them right next to each other with the black swallowtail on the left, the monarch on the right, we can hopefully see their differences. The easiest way is to look for the presence of those head horns and rear horns on the monarch. If they're not there, then we're probably looking at a black swallowtail. Again, I had to put up the red spotted purple and viceroy. The viceroy supposedly has more barbs on it, but the red spotted purple has less. 
And finally, comparing the tiger swallowtail and spice bush swallowtail, both resemble bird droppings, but the spice bush has eye spots in that early instar stage. Okay, I also wanted to put up these four because they're all relatively black bodied caterpillars with spines on them. So it can be easy to confuse them. If we start from the left though, we can look for that white speckling and those orange spots just on the back and that helps us know it's a morning cloak. The next one we have orange to yellow spines that always have black tips. And so that's gonna be our question mark. The red admiral is next and it's going to have that creamy stripe along the side without a lot of extra spots or modeling on its pattern. And finally, the buckeye is going to have those black spines, orange spots on the sides of the bodies, and typically some blue spots along the back as well. All right, so we're going to move on to looking at some moth caterpillars. And we're going to start with the silk moths and look at five different species. Silk moths pupate in tough silken cocoons and do not feed as adults. So when planting, to support them, you only need to provide them a host plant. The one pictured here is a pink striped oakworm moth, not super common, um, but I found one down where I am and thought it looked beautiful, so I had to put it in, in this slideshow here. Okay, first up, we have a polyphemus moth, and the caterpillar is bright green with a brown head and three inches when it's fully grown. But early instars are white with black bands. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of an early instar to show you. You may be able to see faint yellow lines in the center of the segments on this caterpillar, as well as sparse hairs. There are also red bumps along the segments and dark red spiracles. Now, early instars have orange knobs with branch spines, and as they advance through the instars, those bumps and knobs um, are reduced to just these red spots that we can see pictured in this caterpillar. May through October, we can find them on a whole range of native tree species. Okay, the imperial moth caterpillar is another large bright green caterpillar about four inches when fully grown. Early instars can be darker in color, like you could see in the top left picture. We could see cream spiracles and sparse long white hairs. Also, there are four yellow barbed horns near the head and two near the rear. June through August, we can find them on oaks, maples, hickories, and a few other tree species. The Io moth has a green body with white and red stripes and green branched spines. It will be two to three inches when fully grown. And remember, those spines are irritating to the skin. July through October, you can find them on many different tree species. All right, the Luna moth has a bright green body as well. Can you sense the theme with the silk moths? Lots of bright green body caterpillars. And it can have either a green or a brown head. Earlier in stars, which is in the bottom picture here, have cream or red spots with short hairs. And very early instars have branch spines instead of those hairs. Later instars have faint orange spots and a yellow stripe right above the spiracles. March through September, you can find them on hickories, walnuts, and other native trees. Now I do wanna point out when I was looking for pictures of Luna moths, I found a lot of pictures of polyphemus moth caterpillars that were misidentified. So um, it's important to note when looking for caterpillar pictures, there's a lot of misidentified pictures if you just Google something. So I highly recommend using a reputable source and we'll talk about several of those at the end. Um, but it even had me fooled for a while because there were so many pictures that were labeled Luna moths um, that looking at my guide, um, it didn't match what I was seeing in the pictures. So I caution you um, when just Googling those. Okay, Cecropia silk moth caterpillars are again, a green bodied three to four inch full grown caterpillar, but with a very distinctive pattern. We have blue, yellow, and red knobs with black spines. The red knobs are on the second and third thorax segments, yellow on the tops of the abdomen, and blue mostly on the sides, but a few near the head and the rear. There are also light blue spiracles. 
late May through August, you can find them on many different fruit trees and various other species. And our last silk moth is the rosy maple moth, the caterpillar of which is also referred to as the green striped maple worm. Now this guy can cause damage to your maple trees if um, he is found in large populations. The caterpillar is light green with an orange head and a black bulge near the rear. It has faint stripes along the body and rows of black dots to short daubs. There are also two horns that are black behind the head. Host plants are maples as well as oaks, and you can find them April through September. All right, the hornworms are our next group of moths, and we'll look at seven of them. They're called hornworms because of the horn or tail found on most of the caterpillars. The adults are referred to as sphinx, hawk, or hummingbird moths. They are fast and strong flyers with a rapid wing beat, and they usually hover in front of a flower to feed. This one pictured here is a blinded sphinx moth. So the first one we'll look at is the white lined sphinx, which is a green bodied caterpillar, but also has a black form, sometimes in an early instar, but sometimes even the later instars will also be black. We can see yellow spiracles on the side and a black stripe along the back, which runs through some red spots. It also has a yellow tail. Spring through fall, you can find them on many of your garden vegetables, so it can be a pest species. Okay, another hornworm that's a common garden pest is the tobacco hornworm. And yes, the tomato hornworm is a different species. Both will feed on tobacco and tomatoes, and most pictures on the internet misidentify the tobacco hornworm pictured here as the tomato hornworm. We'll look at the tomato shortly, but this one has a green body with seven slanted white stripes on the abdomen with black dots along them. You can see its true legs are black and white striped. It has a red tail and black spiracles. June through September, you can find them in your garden. This caterpillar will become the Carolina Sphinx moth, which has six pairs of orange spots along its body. In comparison, here is the tomato hornworm, and this one will become the five-spotted hawk moth, which looks extremely similar to the Carolina Sphinx, but just has five pairs of orange spots. Now, I will admit it is very difficult to tell the adults apart because that sixth pair of spots is often extremely faint, even when it's present. So I find it easier to tell them apart in caterpillar stage. We can see that it is also green bodied, but hopefully instead of just those white slants, we see that we have cream to white V-shaped stripes. We also have a black tail and we have spiracles as well that aren't black. We can find them the same time of year on the same plants. Another feature is their true legs are green, not black and white striped. So between the tail, the legs, and the pattern of the slashing or the V-shaped stripes, hopefully um, we can better be able to tell those two species apart. Okay, the Pandorus sphinx moth caterpillar can vary in color from bright green to orange, brown, or even pink. Hopefully we can see that there are large spots around the spiracles that can be white, cream, or orange in color and outlined in black. Early instars have a curled tail horn seen in the top picture, and in later instars that tail disappears and it's replaced by an eye spot. June through August you can find this caterpillar on grape and Virginia creeper. Another sphinx moth that is found on the same plants is the Virginia creeper sphinx. It can have a bright green body in early instars and then change to pink, tan, or brown in later instars. You may be able to see seven faint slanted lines on the abdomen that all come together in a stripe and merge at the tail, which is a horn-like tail. March through September, you can find them on the same plants as the Pandora Sphinx. Okay, our last two hornworms are the snowberry clearwing and the hummingbird clearwing, which are often treated as one species. And I know I've been guilty of just assuming that they are one species, but we'll look at both of them, starting with the snowberry clearwing. These caterpillars have a green to dark brown body with a yellow band behind the head and black spiracles. 
They also have a black tail that has a yellow base. April through September, you can find them feeding on coral berry and snowberry, among other plants. One easy way to tell them apart in the adult stage is the adult moth has black legs and the snowberry clear wing. In contrast, the hummingbird clear wing adult is going to have white legs. And we can hopefully see some differences in the way the caterpillars appear as well. This one also has a green body with a yellow band behind the head, but it has red spiracles and red legs and prolegs. And it also has a red tail. And the tail points towards the rear rather than towards the head. It can be found on similar plants March through June and again August through October. And like I said, the adult moth is going to have white legs in the hummingbird clearwing and black in the snowberry clearwing. Okay, we're almost to the end. We're almost there. Our next group of moths are tussock moths, many of which um, are very hairy and can be irritating to your skin. We're just going to look at one, that white marked tussock moth caterpillar that we've seen a couple times in some examples. So I've heard people describe this caterpillar as looking like a piece of sushi. And hopefully we can see it has a cream body, although that may be difficult to see. Um, it has a red head with a black stripe on the top of the body and so many different arrangements of hairs. We have two lashes of black hairs on the head, one lash of orange hair near the rear, four dense groupings of white to yellow hairs on the abdomen near the thorax, tufts of white and yellow hairs along the body and sparse long black hairs along the body as well. May through October, you can find it on elm, maple, and basswood trees. And our last group of moths are the tiger moths, whose caterpillars are often called woolly bears due to their dense clusters of hairs. We'll look at the most popular, the Isabella tiger moth or the banded woolly bear. This caterpillar is black with a reddish orange band covered in dense tufts of hairs. As the caterpillar matures, the black hairs near the rear are replaced with orange hairs. So that band will look like it's expanding over the course of the season if you are able to follow a single caterpillar. You can find them in the spring. Typically we see them late fall through, late summer through late fall. And they like to feed on dandelions, plantains, asters, and goldenrods. Okay, we made it to the end. Let's do another quick review because the green bodied silk moth caterpillars look very similar. So remember that the polyphemus has a brown head and it has faint yellow stripes or excuse me, faint yellow bands. Those go across the segments, remember. Um, the Luna moth has a faint yellow stripe. These two are very easy to confuse. Next, we have the imperial moth, which has those yellow barbed horns. The io moth has that red and white stripe and branched spines. And the cecropia moth has those different colored knobs that have spikes on them. Okay, as we wrap up today, let's talk about some resources. I have found the caterpillars in your yard and garden booklet from Missouri Extension to be very useful. And you can find it online. Um, a website I use a lot to help with caterpillar identification is the Discover Life website. And they have a page on caterpillars that looks like this. I realize it's a small image, that screenshot there. But you can check boxes next to the different characteristics that we talked about today that you notice on the caterpillar you found. And then it gives a list of potential caterpillars that match that description for you to look through. So we could choose, you know, what's the main body color? Is it a green body caterpillar? OK, does it have banding? Is it camouflaged? Is it slashed? Does it have hairs? What is the arrangement of the hairs? And then any of those extra features as well. And then it will give you a whole list that you can look through pictures and try to find one that looks most similar. Next up, we have Butterflies and Moths of North America. I talked about that website a little bit earlier. This is a great place to find information on host plants. And if you do register and create an account, which is free, you can submit pictures of caterpillars and have experts help identify them. I did this one thing once and got a response extremely um, quickly. So it's a great place to also um, get some help with identification. Um, and finally, the University of Florida Featured Creatures website has a lot of information on how to identify caterpillars, especially with information on how different instars look. So that's been very helpful.
Okay, thank you very much for joining me today. I do have a QR code posted right now um, or a link to the survey that I would appreciate you filling out for me. This is a new program, so any feedback is appreciated. Um, you can visit go.illinois.edu slash caterpillars, and I know Peggy's been putting that um, link in the chat box as well. Um, so at this time, Peggy, if we have any questions from the chat box, we can go ahead and um, try to answer those. We do have questions, and I did just put in the link for the evaluation. And to answer, um, someone had just asked if it would be recorded, and, and yes, and the link is there also. It won't be there immediately, but you can check there uh, anytime. It sometimes takes a couple weeks for the closed captioning to get completed, so be patient, but you can always go back and check um, on that. Um, so I was keeping track of some of these questions, and they were good questions, and I want to want to thank our large audience for being so um, useful with the chat and making it easy for me to keep track. The first question that came in very early was, could you define instar? Yes, so an instar is just a different growth stage of a caterpillar. So they typically have five different growth stages and they'll molt between each of those um, to get to the next growth stage. Well, and that's a perfect into the next question, which okay. said, do all caterpillars have five instars, no more, no less? I recently read that an IO moth could have extra instars if it's feeding on a less desirable host plant. Oh, that's very interesting. That's what um, I thought too. <laughs> yeah, I, not all of them have five. There are some that have four. I don't know of some that have more, um, but in general, they have five. I didn't want to get into specifics of how many mm -hmm. instars they have. But yes, it's, you know, like I said many times, they don't always follow the rules. So there's always going to be a few that don't have five. <laughs> Uh, right, then who knows what they're doing when we're not looking. Um, are caterpillars that rely on ash trees in danger, or do you expect they will just use another host plant as emerald ash borers come th um, have come through here? Anything we can do to help with that impact? That is a great question. I don't know of off the top of my head. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Um, I don't know of any caterpillars that are... Um, that only use an ash tree as a host plant. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times they have multiple different species that they will feed on. Um, so in that case, if they lose the ash tree, they just lost one food source. Mm -hmm. um, but I assume, yes, if there is a caterpillar out there that just uses an ash tree, then I assume that its population will also be in trouble. Nice, that makes sense. And Peggy, I'm going to retype. I think that link that you posted mm -hmm. had uh, an extra period in it. Okay. So I'm going to try. I apologize. Sometimes the hyperlinking doesn't work when we type these things into the chat box. Um, let me try one more time. That, so hopefully you can just click it. Um, there yeah, we go. For the, for the evaluation or the YouTube? For the evaluation. I think okay. I got it. Okay. Go on. <laughs> no, we want you to get those evaluations. Make sure we got it in there. <laughs> yeah, and it would be, it's probably the typist, not the, not the linking. Um, so another question, and I know you talked about how some of these um, little animals have irritating hairs. Are there any that are considered uh, a poisonous or venomous um, toxin, I guess? That is a great question as well. I'm not sure if they are actually what what is happening when you know we feel that sting i'm mm -hmm. assuming well i don't know they may be releasing some sort of chemical um but that's a good question that i'd have to research more before well, I, I would i would think it would be a, a, an irritant like yeah. you said a toxin mm -hmm. um i've not heard of anyone having a like an allergic reaction to a serious right, but, but some yeah. someone could have an allergy yes. to that toxin, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but but as far as poisonous or venomous, I've not heard that either. So, um, your favorite they said, is there a field guide? I would say, what is your favorite field guide to Illinois caterpillars? So, if you could tell, I didn't mention any book resources like print book resources because I don't actually have any. Um, there is a Peterson. Um, caterpillar guide that's kind of like a beginner intro to caterpillars that I've used before and that one's really good um, but 
I've used a lot of these web resources, which I know is not everyone's preference, um, but they've been really great for me. Um, so if anyone has suggestions, I welcome hearing those. Um, that's not something I've gotten into yet is looking at specific book resources. I happen to have too many, so I could share with you. Yes, Peggy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, can you tell the age difference uh, in the two of us? Um, so there was a question about ordering. Have you ever heard of ordering caterpillars to release um, in your butterfly garden? Oh, like raising your own caterpillars? Yeah. Um, yes, I know. I mean, we did that in kindergarten. <laughs> we raised caterpillars mm -hmm. and released them. Um, I know so several people do that. I know some um, moth species are pretty easy to raise at home. So that is something that if you're trying to increase the population, um, you could do, but I would also just encourage you to make sure that those food sources are there first and then see if those caterpillars and those butterflies start showing up. Um, because it could just be a matter of you're not seeing them because you don't have the proper plants to support them. And that's, that kind of leads into, and you shared with us that the Viceroy um, likes to host on willow, elm, poplar, oak, aspen, and wild cherry. And mm -hmm. because someone had asked if the Viceroy also feeds on milkweed um, prior not, to you listing yeah. those. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yep. Not that I know of. Mm -hmm. I would think that would make them toxic, you know, to, to mm -hmm. the burn, have the burn, and that's, that would, it wouldn't be the same. But is there a benefit to the caterpillars for changing appearance so much in an instant, sorry about that, appearance so much in each instar? Is there maybe less time for predators to focus on them? So it's a question of what do you think the advantage is to being, to look so differently? That was totally new to me, to look so differently in the different instars for some of them. Right. Well, what I have noticed, again, not always the case, is in a lot of the early instars, a lot of the times they have spines that will then fade. Um, and a lot of the early instars are the ones that look like bird droppings. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's um, more of a defense mechanism when they're smaller. Uh, but again, you know, many of them have spines as through all five instars, right? Um, so I would just assume that, you know, through evolution, that has been what has helped them to survive. So I would assume it's a predator defense. Mm -hmm. so another question, do moths feed during the day or are they strictly nocturnal? So some species do feed during the day. In general, um, you know, as a group, we say moths prefer to feed at night but there are always exceptions and there definitely are some species that I've seen out in broad daylight. So. <laughs> yeah, it's, their, it's a, it's a decision of theirs. <laughs> um, do caterpillars have actual eyes? I don't actually know. That's another good question. I don't know that I've seen, I assume they do. Mm -hmm. Some might not. But yeah, I don't think I've gotten quite that close microscopically to see if they have eyes. Well, and it's, and there's so, you know, you, the difference between caterpillar and butterfly is so amazing that, you know, we always look at the butterfly so much more closely. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And they must have some form of eye, possibly even a compound eye. I don't know. Um, this one says there are, there are many very small caterpillars on my mature asparagus plants in my garden. It was a statement, but I'm wondering if they're thinking what, what that might be, if you would know what would eat asparagus. Not off the top of my head, yeah. A if hungry wanna, caterpillar. If you'd want to send a, send a close-up picture, um, just another um, tip, if you are ever sending in a picture of a caterpillar, um, try to get a close-up clear picture of that caterpillar and also take pictures and if you can identify what plant it's on like the asparagus that's a perfect help because that can really help us narrow down what we're looking at and the last question was how big is that pandorus sphinx the caterpillar I, or the yeah I just said that that was the question so either one that you know Okay, um, the caterpillar, I believe, when it's fully mature, can be three to four inches in size. Holy cow, okay, that's big. And then, so like those silk moth, the silk moth um, 
caterpillars can be quite large. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the moth is rather large as well. Again, I don't have a specific um, measurement, but it's on the larger end of a moth species. If you've seen sphinx moths before, they're pretty big. Mm -hmm. um, some of them can be, you know, at least half the size of the palm of your hand up to the size of the palm of your hand. So they can get pretty large. That's interesting. And what were you, this is my question. You were saying that um, some of those larger silk moths, so they, they don't have, they have mouth parts as a caterpillar, but not as an adult. Yes. I think they said, so what's yep. the, what, so what do they do? So they will emerge as adults, mate, and then die. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> interesting, interesting. Um, somebody did share in the chat that there's a, a wonderful app, but you have to pay for it. Uh, I just okay. want to make sure people saw that on their own um, for caterpillars. Um, thank you for fixing that, people. I see why you saw. I wasn't seeing it because I was worried about the questions. That's okay. So no worries. I got somebody wrote. I got bitten by a moth caterpillar one time and had a gigantic allergic reaction. That took oh no! To go away. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> I, um, I'm just looking at see what else. There's some books. Make sure you check the chat before you leave, folks. There's some uh, recommendations for Great. books. And I'm trying to scan really quickly through here. And I know Aaron uh, fixed the link. Um, yeah, there's just so many people helping out and responding. So check that chat before you go and make sure um, I'm looking for your um, link, Aaron, to be sure I see it. Did you see it to go with through there? For the evaluation. It's, yes, it did. And it's it still up. Mm -hmm. And you and folks, it's still sitting right there on that last screen. I had a dot behind the edu. So that go.illinois.edu slash caterpillars. Or you could QR code it. Yep. And we will follow up um, as well with that link as well for the evaluation. And I'm going to resend that link to the handouts because that I had more technical difficulties than I was expecting. So thank you everyone yeah, for, I thought it went for really being well. patient. So. Yeah, no, I think it went well and it was really good information. Um, and I think everybody's looking and seeing caterpillars at this point. So that's how fa it was fantastic. I learned so much. Um, Wonderful. Yeah. Well, great. I think for mm -hmm. interest of time, since we've gone a little bit over mm -hmm. 2.30, um, we'll go ahead and end for today. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, if you do have more specific questions, you can feel free to email me. My email is on the on the screen, and that's who you'll be receiving um, the follow-up emails from. So you can always feel free to respond and ask questions. But thank you so much, and thank, thank you, you, Peggy. Thank you, everybody. Hmm.